to welcome everybody to our April 28th Metro Management Council meeting. Thanks for being here. Um, we do have a quorum, but we do only have three of us here uh, today. Councilor Colleen, Commissioner Bennett, and myself. Uh, but it is enough to uh, move forward with the business that we got to address today. At least we can make motions and have a second. That's right. <laughs> right. We need a third to fourth when we travel, but um, got the agenda in front of us. Just need a motion to approve it. So moved. Second. All right. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Agenda's approved. My mic up. Sounds good. All right. Uh, let's, anybody here for public input today on anything? Any topics? Man, <coughs> love it. We never have public input at these meetings, don't we? All right, we'll move on to item three. Uh, minutes dated April 8th. Uh, that meeting, we yeah, had. we just had a meeting uh, two weeks ago now, so, um, uh, excuse me, three weeks ago. You guys got those sent out to you. Did you uh, have any changes you want to make or make a motion there? Move to approve. Second. All right, a motion to approve the minutes uh, by Kylie, seconded by Benninga. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that passes, three to zero. Well, we'll move on to item four, resolution 21-01, employee benefits. Scott. Well, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Scott McMahon, Director of Metro Communications. Uh, as you indicated, being it was just two, three weeks ago that we're here, there was no director's report for today, so we'll move right into the agenda items. Uh, agenda item number four is the approval of resolution number 21-01, which is employee benefits related. Uh, Metro Communications Agency contracts for the management of our employee health savings and flexible spending accounts. Our current provider has made some institutional changes that have impacted their ability to provide Metro with the level of service that we've been accustomed to receiving. Dakota Care Administrative Services Incorporated is a local vendor with many years of experience and expertise in providing these services. Uh, I am requesting Metro Management Council to adopt resolution number 21-01, authorizing our agency to transfer management of these benefits from TASC to Dakota Care Administrative Services Incorporated, effective June 1st, 2021. Metro has contracted with Dakota Care Administrative Services Incorporated in the past for flexible savings account management services, and we look forward to obtaining these services from them once again. All right, so um, TASC right now only does the, the HSA work? HSA and flexible uh, spending accounts, yes. Okay. Um, and what were, you said some institutional changes. What, what's kind of the, what are they doing that's? The, the company made some software changes and, and some other institutional changes that uh, resulted in us uh, receiving service that was uh, less than what we had received in the past and, and we just felt that it was time to explore to see what other companies uh, might be able to assist us in this area and when we found a local vendor Dakota Care and we've had past experience with them and, and we uh, know that some of the other um, uh, government agencies and so forth use Dakota Care it seemed like the right fit to shop local and, and work with the, the local vendor. I, I should know this because I'm looking at city employees in the room. Do, do we use TASC? Uh, Matt, do you happen to know? What do we use for HSA? Do you know, do you know that, Anna? Yeah, I do. You have, the, you have a vendor that tries to remove your MUNIS. MUNIS? Software. Yeah, okay. And both the county and the city is the ones who transferred to MUNIS, made that change. The county Got it. Through TASC, and that's how Metro ended up with TASC. Okay. But this year, the Okay. Any questions that you guys have on that one? No? All right. Need a motion? Motion to approve agenda item four. Seconded All right. by Kylie. <coughs> motion Excuse by me. Benninga, seconded by Kylie on that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that carries 3-0. Uh, surplus property declaration, item five. Okay, agenda item number five is declaration of surplus property. Uh, Metro and Communications Agency has identified the following property as surplus and asked the Metro Management Council to approve the disposal of these assets under SDCL 6-5-5, which allows local governments to lease, sell, give, or otherwise convey real and personal property to other units of government, and SDCL 6-13-1, which allows local governments to surplus and dispose of property by appropriate motion. 
Uh, the items that are listed here, for the most part, are uh, computer items that are quite old. Uh, the hard drives have been removed, and then uh, chairs that are well beyond their 12 years of warranty period, and uh, they're highly used and uh, broken in, in some cases. So, you got, you got good mileage out of them. I'm yes, assuming. we did. Yes. <laughs> You guys got any questions on these surplus items? Can't imagine why you'd get rid of computers that have no hard drive. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I move to uh, approve uh, item number five. Second. All right. Motion by Kylie, second by Benninga to approve item five. Uh, we'll take a vote on that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That is 3 0. Passes. Uh, we'll move to item six. 2022 budget, a continuation from our presentation uh, three weeks ago. Scott? Yes, continuation. Uh, we did put together some new information that we'd like to present to you today. Um, our goal is at Metro Communications is to provide efficient PSAP operations. And when we say efficient, we mean that both operationally as well as from a fiscal standpoint, that we want to make sure that uh, our city and county governments are receiving uh, the best bang for their dollar. And uh, that's what we're going to try and do over the, the course of time here is to work towards efficient PSAP operations. Uh, Director, Deputy Director Amy Chase is going to join me today as we go through this presentation. So you recall from the last meeting, um, we had an opportunity to obtain $1,042,862 uh, from the State 91 Coordination Board. And these are items that we have identified that we'd like to both use for personnel as well as uh, equipment expenditures. Uh, some of these expenditures would be for the new facility. Uh, some are for today's environment. Um, but we have, this, we have this opportunity and we'd <coughs> like to explain uh, in detail why we we're requesting personnel as, as part of that uh, fund that we'd like to, to use those funds for. So, the next page is our 2022 proposed budget, which you saw this at the last meeting. But I'd like to focus under the, the 2022 budget itself. Um, we recognize that in 2020 and 2021, the city and county saw a significant increase in your support to Metro Communications. And that was a result of us uh, adding four communication operator positions in our agency. Um, we also realized that in 2022, it's still a significant in increase, but less than what it's been in the previous two years at 15%. Um, and then you'll notice on line seven in blue there, there's $326,307. That, that would be the number that would be uh, related to the personnel funding that we're asking for from the state, as well as any other grant opportunities that we might come across. And then line, line 16 is the $307,000. Um, that particularly is the uh, four positions that we'd receive funding for from the state. The business support, uh, which is a, which is a, uh, a part-time position, um, that is $52,228. That's a position to support Anna through um, accounting and um, other aspects that, that she performs from her office. And then we have the temp hours, which is the 74,196. That's a number that's been moved forward from, from last year into 2022 and then into 2023. Uh, that number hasn't changed um, as far as our request amount. And we really see a great value out of those temporary positions. I think I reported to you at the last meeting that from September of 19 through December of, of 20, uh, those, part, there, those temporary positions uh, worked about 3,200 hours. So we really just get a, a great amount of, of work out of, of those temporary positions and they really help our agency to, um, to use resources in a manner where we don't maybe need a full-time person uh, to fill all those hours, but in an occasion we can have a temp come in to help fill a vacation leave or some other type of leave. So then on line 41, you'll see that at the end of 2022, our ending cash balance is $1,196,440. Again, that's related to the uh, fairly large increases the last two years. We're trying to bring that ending cash uh, balance up to account for some future years uh, uh, 
that we plan to add employees. So then uh, the last line to look at is line 53 under the year 2026. You'll see our cash balance of $642,000. Um, that number we'll talk more towards line the end. Line was that? I'm sorry to interrupt. It's on line 53 and it's under the year 2026, so straight under the 2022 proposed budget. We don't have a, we don't have that page in here. So we no, we, ours ends at. Is it on the way bottom? Well, on the screen up there it is, but. We end with line, line 49. Okay. So look at line 48. Line okay. 48. Oh, there we go. For some reason, my sheet's a little bit different. So line 48 represents that 642,000 <laughs> um, that we'll, we'll discuss a little bit later as, as we get to the, uh, the final part of our presentation today. So the next page is a SWOT analysis. The leadership team at Metro Communications spent a considerable amount of time uh, basically just looking at all aspects of our organization and trying to identify where our strengths and our weaknesses were. And through that process, uh, we identified these particular topics as, as weaknesses, and several of those are related to staffing, um, task overload, uh, retention, those types of things, as well as the internal affairs process. As our leadership has discussed and created strategies on how to improve these topic areas um, through many, many conversations, uh, we recently realized that our strategies and our discussions uh, re very much resemble a an article that we recently come across from NINA, which is the National Emergency Number Association. There was an article that was produced by NINA that's called the Lean PSAP. It's a way to make 911 centers better at what they do. And that's become, that's become our focus over the last year and a half, two years, is to become lean, become efficient, and uh, it just so happens that what we are doing happened to have uh, some study and some research behind it. So. So some of the quotes that we took from this uh, recent article is that the lean concept is about removing extraneous steps in a center's work process. So basically what we're saying is, is we don't want to add more workload to our operators at the councils that they're working at. Instead, we want to use procedure and technology to reduce the amount of workload that's occurring at each one of those stations. The idea is to leverage the center's available resources more efficiently to enhance the quantity and quality of what is being accomplished. So what we've done is we've reviewed the uh, job task at all levels of our agency, and then we have uh, went back and we reviewed and said, where should those tasks truly be in our agency? Should it be at the deputy director? Should it be at the director? Should it be at a coordinator level? Um, this has really helped us to identify where the workload should be done in our agency. Leanness doesn't necessarily constitute fewer personnel. Instead, it requires that all personnel are well-trained and well-suited for new responsibilities emerging in a PSAP. Uh, again, through our training process, which we have high confidence level in, as well as just changing with the profession. So as, as new things are introduced to the 911 industry, we want to make sure we're prepared to do that and that we have our resources allocated properly to do that. So the next page of Lean PSAP quotes uh, we feel support our idea of the division supervisors. And where this uh, first quote says is that may require reorganization and redistribution of personnel resources to accommodate emerging and evolving needs. Again, identifying where the tasks are in the agency and where to assign those. The micro goal is to make personnel as efficient as possible in their responsibilities, while the macro goal is to enable the agency to reduce the time it takes to perform tasks add value and enhance quality. Those things are very important in our agency is to uh, make sure we're delivering quality service and that tasks are being performed um, where they should be in the agency. The goal is not achieved by turning personnel into multitaskers and we have uh, found that in our, in our research of our agency that over the years you, you take on more tasks as the industry changes, you add those tasks to all levels of the agency and uh, research has shown that we as humans can't necessarily multitask. We can focus on one thing, we can focus on another thing independently, but we can't do many tasks at the same time. Um, so what we're trying to do here with the uh, shift supervisors, which Amy's gonna introduce you to here in a second, is to take some of those tasks and reassign them so that uh, they're not trying to multitask as a supervisor and, and, and at the same time work at council. So at that point, I'm gonna turn it over to Amy to go through some of these other ideas. 
Good afternoon. Hi, Amy. So as I took a look at our operational staff, I wanted to make sure we were efficient as possible within all levels. So the first level is our communications operators. And so if you're looking at this graphic that I have up on the screen, the person on the left represents all filled with orange. Their role is 100% operational. They're answering incoming emergency and non-emergency calls. They're dispatching our law enforcement officers, our fire and our EMS staff. They're completely full, and we talked about that a couple of weeks ago at our last meeting, how they're already exceeding the 85% agent occupancy where we'd like to see them. So where we would like to see them is the graphic on the right-hand side, where their head is clear, they have some surge capacity, because we know in our profession there's always going to be things that come up where we need that surge capacity. So the way to get from the left to the right is by increasing our operational staff, hiring more employees. Those are more employees to staff in the center to answer our incoming calls, and that's driven by an increase in population as well as an increase in call for service growth, but also uh, increase the number of staff that we have at our dispatch consoles, and we talked about that at our last meeting as well, looking at the push to talks and that bottleneck and recognizing that we have to add operational staff to, to alleviate some of that workload. So to get from the left to the right, the answer is to increase our staffing based on the request that we presented last month. So then we look to the next level, the shift supervisor level. So our shift supervisors are included in our staffing numbers. So they are responsible for the operational tasks, just like the communications operators. They're tasked with answering incoming emergency and non-emergency calls. They're also tasked with sitting dispatch boards and handling those dispatch functions. But in addition to those tasks, they are also responsible for operational supervisory tasks. And back in 2011, we lost our operations coordinator and our administrative support uh, positions, and those were budget cuts. So those tasks that those two positions were responsible for didn't go away. What happened is those tasks were redistributed throughout the agency. Some were given to the deputy director position, some were given to the coordinators, and a lot of them were placed on the shift supervisor. So if you look at the graphic on the left, those are the blue tasks. And I use this graphic, you can see it's a blue square. They are overflowing, they are overloaded. Not only are they completely full, but because they're doing these tasks, they're doing too much. So really our focus was we want to get this position and focus here and make it as efficient as possible. And to go back to that quote that Scott mentioned, the micro goal is to make personnel as efficient as possible in their responsibilities and add value and enhance quality. So through our research, we wanna get them to the graphic on the right. We want their focus to be operational and operations supervisory tasks. Everything within our organization, the operation is that focus. We wanna make sure that we're providing quality service to our community as well as to the responders that we serve, as well as keeping their head clear and understanding that they need surge capacity. So the way to get from the left to the right, our solution is these two division supervisors. So our goal would be to take those blue administrative supervisory tasks and reallocate those to the division supervisor. And what's important to know is that you are, through that process, we're not taking an operational position off the floor. What we're doing is we're taking the tasks that took that operational supervisor off the floor. So we're redistributing those tasks, and as a result, we make the shift supervisor more efficient and more able to focus on those operational tasks and provide that support to our operators. Uh, an additional goal of those division supervisors is also to assist at my level. Uh, Scott mentioned through our SWOT analysis, we looked at the internal affairs process. So the addition of these two division supervisors also allows me surge capacity. Uh, and so we're really looking at efficiencies from the top down in our operational staff. Okay. So with these two division supervisors, as I said, is it allows us to reallocate those administrative responsibilities from the shift supervisor to the division supervisor. With a goal, right now we have nine shift supervisors. Our long-term goal is to lessen that number down to six. And that might be through this promotional process, but it also could be through att attrition down the road, but that's our long-term goal. And by doing so, 
what that allows us to do is really develop leaders within our organization. Our advanced communications operators are our training staff, and it will allow us to continue to develop their leadership skills and allow them to act in what we call a shift lead role and do some of those operational supervisory duties in the absence of a supervisor. Um, so it does lead to some succession planning there. Um, it also allows us to enhance the management of these high risk, low frequency operations. So for an example, right now, if we get a large scale emergency that happens, whether that's a weather related event, that's a civil unrest, it's a blizzard that uh, results in 50 accidents. What's happening is that's a busy time in our center. Calls are coming in. Our shift supervisors are responsible for those operational tasks. So instead of overseeing the event, they're answering those incoming calls instead of supervising the floor. So by reallocating some of these tasks, we're actually allowing them to focus on the operationals and the division supervisor can run lead on those events and um, enhance that management so the, the operational shift supervisor can really focus where they need to and thus make them more efficient. Can I ask you a question in that Absolutely. example? Yep. Just because you know I've been in the facility a few times and mm -hmm. it's never during an event. So you have a blizzard and there's 50 accidents in the course of an hour. You said the, the shift supervisor has to help manage that event. What, what does that mean? What, did that, what does that entail if they're, Help me understand what they're doing during that time. Well, okay. what they're doing now is they're answering incoming right. calls and they're dispatching the help. But, but with this change, what would they do then? So it would allow them to make sure that the proper notifications are going out for certain large scale incidents. There are additional tasks that need to be done and making sure that those are being done um, and not being missed or fall through the cracks, as well as offering support to our staff. You know, if we have newer employees who that might be their first time dealing with that large scale incident, they're gonna need additional support. And right now, with the layout that we have, they're not able to do that because their focus is on those operational tasks, those orange color versus the green color. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. let's, may, let's maybe relate it back to uh, a little over a year ago when we had three tornadoes come in. Sure. How, how would this proposed organizational uh, structure have impacted that situation and maybe led to some added efficiencies and quality. Sure. I think the, the added efficiencies comes through um, the division supervisors being aware. Awareness is the most important thing when you have a critical event. And if that division supervisor can monitor the overall operations and hear from our partner agencies what struggles that they're having, because when you have somebody that's not sitting at a council, and this is, Oftentimes what I do uh, as a leader in an agency is, is I go out on the floor and I don't ask questions to the operator, but I be that the, uh, the ears to the organization so that I can hear that all this activity is happening and what other agencies are looking for. And that's what we're looking for the division supervisor to do is to hear what's, what's happening and then make sure that we have allocated resources to those things that are being requested. And so for the tornado event, um, our supervisors were part of the call taking group that night. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. But if we'd had a division supervisor there, they would have said, okay, I was standing over by fire. I heard that they need this resource at this location. Are we making sure that all that is happening? Are we making sure that the, the wheels are in motion on all these events? And in, in addition to that, the division supervisor, this person that's off the floor, that is well trained in incident command system, that's well trained in, in how to properly manage an incident, can start thinking ahead of, okay, so if this is happening, that tells me that we're gonna have to start preparing and planning for the next step, which is this step. So again, you can't multitask, you can't do all these things while you're answering the phone, but if you don't have the counsel you're working and you're in a supervisor capacity where you can say, okay, but I, I know that this needs to be done. I know these other tasks are gonna be requested even though they may have not been requested yet by a partner agency, or maybe it's something we can even um, suggest to a partner agency that do you want us to start working on this activity? Well, and that's what I was kind of getting out of it. I mean, if you're, if, if you're actually answering phones or, or other calls, it seems like you can't uh, 
monitor the situation as a whole and anticipate things that are coming until yeah. they're already on top of you. Yeah. And I know I have uh, Justin Faber here today, our quality assurance coordinator, and, and Amy as the deputy director. Whenever you have an act, after action review of what went wrong in an incident, it's oftentimes uh, connected to a communication piece or it's connected to awareness piece that somebody didn't know what the other somebody was doing. And uh, that's what we're trying to do with the division supervisors to make sure that we have somebody in our agency that is fully aware and is pre-planning for what that next step is going to be. And uh, our thought idea is, is this person would work um, weekends so that in the absence of the entire leadership staff, even though Amy and I stop in quite frequently on weekends, um, we'd, have, uh, we'd have somebody there that's at a higher level than the supervisor to manage the incident, get us notified, make all the other notifications that need to happen, start pre-planning um, so we know and, and be the eyes and the ears of what's going on so when, when we come in, they can give us a quick briefing, then we can take over and, and manage the incident from there. In other words, it would introduce a nimbleness that is not currently available to you. Correct. Right. Okay. All right. You got okay. it, one more slide here? There is one more the slide, and uh, I'm going to have to beg for your patience on this one because I've got quite a few notes listed. Um, so we as Metro leadership staff know that it's incumbent upon us to, to provide a projection of what our future staffing needs are. And we understand that this is only a recommendation um, and that our future staffing levels are, are based upon the city and the county's ability to support what our recommendations are. So when we go through these things, um, we understand, you know, that you don't always receive what it is that you're requesting. So um, we, we know that ahead of time, but we feel it's our obligation or our responsibility to introduce you to what we view our projections are in the next five years. So this is a year-end 2026 cash projection. So if you go under the uh, left-hand side where it talks about grant funded as presented, 642,000, um, you know, what we're trying to avoid is a situation like we've had the last two years where we've had significant increases to the city and county because of the fact that we added four staff. So we're trying to um, think of another way that we can self-fund staff without making an increase for the city and county. So that's why we went on to search for some grant funding. And uh, with this funding from the state, we'd be able to fund those four positions entirely in 22 and 23. So then uh, beyond that, because this is a five-year plan, so years 23 through 26, to account for population growth, to account for partner agency growth, we added one position each year. But again, we, we understand that uh, that may not be able to happen. What this also does is it gives us an ability that if we decide, okay, we can't add staff because of population growth or because partner agency growth, but we want to try and do something that we know is affixed to this uh, PD council where we have too many push to talks happening. This might be an opportunity that we can um, use these additional four positions, not, not the grant funded ones, but the, the four for the next few years. We might be able to try and make something work there. So um, the idea is, is to put it in a projection, knowing that it's gonna be entirely up to the city and county level of support uh, as far as whether we're able to obtain those positions or not. The internal promotion of the two division supervisors, um, that is a expense neutral, because if we move supervisors from their current supervisor position to this uh, new promotion, uh, there's, there's relatively little cost to that because uh, holiday pay would no longer be paid and, and uh, you know, some different benefit things there where it basically becomes expense neutral. The part-time business support person, uh, we did talk through that uh, in our earlier page on the budget. Um, that is an expense and, uh, you know, that's something that uh, we certainly feel is a need at this point to assist Anna in some of the many tasks that she has in our agency. 
So looking at the right side, what we did is we tried to do a comparison. We said, okay, let's, let's uh, say that we did receive all eight of these positions that we are projecting, but we didn't accept the grant money. So if we didn't accept the grant money and we still gained the eight positions, uh, it would cost us an additional $180,000 uh, to do that without accepting the grant money. But again, we understand that uh, the, eight, the additional four positions beyond the grant funded uh, may not happen. We'll, we'll discuss those in future years, um, see what the uh, um, budget climate is for both the city and county, and we can, we can talk through those during those years. So we're, we're a mid-sized PSAP, and we're approaching that large PSAP number, which is 75 employees or more. And uh, we've been very fortunate here at Metro to not have some of the concerns that larger PSAPs have. Um, we're able to answer all of our 9-1 calls, or I should say 98% of our 9-1 calls in 15 seconds or less. Sometimes that doesn't happen in a larger agency. We're able to deliver the quality service that our, our public expects, as well as our partner agencies uh, in a timely manner. Uh, but this five-year plan that we're proposing keeps us at that level that we are today. And that's a level that our partner agencies uh, count on, and that's a level that our, our community counts on to make sure that these calls are answered in a timely manner. So as you move down Lower on the sheet, it talks about our annual, average annual growth from 2008 to 2026. The city and county support on an average through those years has been about a 6% increase. Um, and then all budget expenditures, and that's each year, 6%. All budget expenditures was a 4% increase each year through those years. Now the one solution to to uh, solving some of our financial concerns without keeping coming back to the county and the city to ask for additional funding is uh, to try and grow partnerships and also understand that our 9-1 surcharges are, are only increasing by 1% annual growth. And right now, the surcharges fund about 51% of our operations, but expected by 2026 with these additional costs being added into our budget, the surcharges are only going to cover about 40% of our annual budget. So we know we need to do some things uh, differently, and that's why we're, we're working on partnerships as much as we can, um, having discussions anyway, and, and trying to be efficient in our, in our cost and our, uh, in our operations. So with the uh, surcharge uh, funds that we receive, uh, in 1989, it was 75 cents is what we received way back in 1989. Um, today, it's 97 cents. It says 2021 is 97 cents. So um, that hasn't grown much in all that time. So it's, uh, it's no wonder why we can expect that it's not covering 100% of our budget or, in this case, even 50% anymore without there being some type of change. And our change, we hope, is, is more consolidation of PSAPs or a collaboration of working together to try and form partnerships to bring those costs down statewide. So our recommendation, based on everything that you've heard today, would be for the Metro Management Council to permit Metro to accept the grant funding for the four operators in 2022 and 2023, and then the additional operators beyond that, we'll consider those in future years. Um, and then our recommendation also uh, would be to um, permit us to work on that part-time business support or to, uh, to advertise for a part-time business support position. And then, of course, the division supervisors, we, we're open to hear some comments that, that you may have about that. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Who wants to start with questions? You want to start? Sure. Um, I understand where you guys are coming from, and frankly, there's I need to understand a couple other things because uh, the county's limited this year by 
revenue growth of about an estimate of 2.65%, which is, <clears throat> frankly, doesn't even really cover the current staff that we have with uh, inflationary increases and cost of insurance and those kinds of things. So to propose a 9% growth is going to be, frankly, impossible for us. Um, when we talk about multitasking versus direct staff, um, in my world and the other worlds I deal with, multitasking is not an assumption, it's practicality, if you will, especially when we have limited resources and limited time. And I know we've used national averages, but sure. unfortunately, I'm one of those people that doesn't agree with national ratios versus South Dakota ratios because I can drive nine miles across to the Minnesota border and my cost of living goes up 28%. That's why we're having growth coming to Sioux Falls rather than, I think your idea of doing the PSAP consolidations is something we've been working on, but it has to be a higher priority for all of us, including working with the state. Um, I've had some conversations in the last few days, weeks, about um, issues with game fish and parks calls and the growth that Humane Society is seeing because they're not being answered and we have to make multiple calls to that group. The other thing that was brought to my attention is if we have something like a, an accident at, let's say, 57th and wherever, or if we have a flood at Louise Avenue, how many calls really affect your staffing because everybody picks up their cell phone, I've seen it happen, where you get 40 or 50 phone calls about one event, which I understand, but how do we manage some of that? Because people are gonna have to, frankly, multitask. Yeah. At this point, one of the areas that I would be saying we need to delay for sure is the division supervisor uh, issues because I really feel strongly that uh, we may have to look at that area as maybe a want rather than a need for a while because we've been operating the way we have for almost 10 years without that position or those two positions. And I don't want to be negative. I want to support Metro Communications as much as I can. But unfortunately, I have the other hat that I have to wear to make sure that I take care of the 555 employees or whatever we have. I would say that I think the county, and I'm sticking my foot in my mouth, which I'm good at, but the whole issue of any additional admin functions that Anna and her staff have to deal with, and I know she works hard, but to absorb the HR through the county and the accounting additional support Maybe we can delegate some of that to the county and the city without increasing cost um, because 45 or 50 of the additional functions that we may have with that function um, is easier to absorb in a larger organization than it is for a smaller one. <clears throat> and I think we've made investments in equipment and facilities and all those kind of things to try to enhance retention and I hope it's working. We'll find out for sure over the years, but this is probably the not what you want to hear, but I don't think this is the right time for all of these changes to happen. Uh, timing is everything in our real world. Um, I guess I have a couple of questions also about is the grant uh, a guaranteed amount that we're going to get that. You've yes. already been acknowledged that that's going to happen, um, which is awesome. Um, and as far as the uh, additional purchases of equipment, did we plan for those things in our bonding budget or when we paid off bonds or some of those other things? Or is that something that's arrived in the last few months or whatever time frame? Sure. Those are a lot of questions I have, and frankly, trying to explain that to uh, the county sheriff or the rural ambulances or the fire departments and the ambulances that we have in rural locations is going to be difficult when our funding we know is going to be 
fixed at somewhere around that 2.65%. And there might be opportunities in the future when we get some of the CARES Act funding sorted and some of those other pieces that we don't have definitions for, but this budget's gonna be a struggle. Sure. So I also believe in local numbers versus national numbers and uh, that is that is the the reason why we didn't bring forward uh, some of the APCO information about uh, the one operator per every 400 4400 population because here today we're more close to the one operator per 5100 people and this plan supports trying to keep us at that same level uh, and we know that we have uh, a lot of people moving to the state of South Dakota. And matter of fact, out of our recent applicant list, we have several people that have applied from out of state. Sure. So we know that that is occurring where, where people are moving to Sioux Falls and, and that's great uh, you know, that, to have the additional people come here. Um, so we understand also that uh, you know, finances are tight. They're tight everywhere. And uh, what we're trying to do with these four operators through this grant funding is to prevent the city or county from having to pay anything extra on those four positions for the two years. We feel that was, that was a, a win to have that grant funding available. Um, the the uh, business assistant, that is, that is a direct expense for Metro. And you know maybe, maybe we can think outside the box a little bit on that. Maybe that's working with the city and county to alleviate some of the work that Anna does, or maybe that's <coughs> a, a temporary position at a le lesser amount of hours than a part-time position. So there's some things we can do there as well to reduce those costs. Um, I think from the division supervisor, again, we viewed that as uh, expense neutral, so it really wasn't more of a cost, it's just realigning staff to do the tasks that they should um, and reduce it from having nine people involved in, the, in making a product to having two people heavily involved, well-trained and very uh, knowledgeable about something it just makes it easier to have two people versus nine people working on a project. So yep, that, that was the idea there. And it's not that I don't support what you're presenting. I wish I could make that work. Sure. But uh, to be blunt, it's gonna be difficult. Okay. Go ahead, Councilor Kelly. Thank you. Well, first of all, you know, I made the statement at our last meeting, I'm public safety and you are the tip of the spear of public safety. It doesn't happen unless it goes through you and then you dispatch, dispatch it to the other teams that have to respond. That's gotta be number one, has to be number one. Priori priority over anything else the city or the county does. Um, and time is of the essence and lives are in the balance when it, when it comes to what you do and then the ability of the responders to get on site or wherever they need to address, to address whatever that emergency is. You know, so the pro uh, project funding, I mean, that's a, that's a no-brainer. Why would we not take state funding that's gonna uh, actually cover four additional positions for us for the two-year period? Right. And we know that two years from now, we're going to need more staff beyond those positions, but at least we would have them uh, potentially in advance of that as well, too. Um, you know, you've done a great job. All of you have done a great job in managing uh, your, your budget, and, and an example of that are the temporary positions, which provides us with the contact hours without the expense of the benefits. So we're, we're getting much bigger bang for our buck, uh, so to speak, in that. And this isn't just like throwing do darts at a wall. I mean, you did your, your you, you analyze your strengths and your weaknesses and your operations and your threats to your operations through your uh, SWOT analysis. So this was very analytical approach. And, and that I do, I do a, appreciate. Because in my world of science, you identify what the problem is and then you address that problem. You, uh, otherwise, you, you don't have any idea what, what you're doing and what, whether you're gonna be effective, effective or not. So, you know, I, I like the idea of a, a lean PSAP, but not to the point where everybody is trying to 
to be a jack of all trades because we know that when you're a jack of all trades, you're a master at none. Right. And we can't afford that in this position. We have to be effective and efficient at performing, performing our duties. So I, I do support the use of the support division supervisors because I help it gets you to that point where you are going to be more effective and more efficient with, without losing that time. To me, it's a little bit like uh, being able to call an audit, audible at the line or have to spend a time out and then go over it and take additional time to analyze what you need to do. And we don't have that when we have three tornadoes racing through the city at one time. And there's probably some events that might have been able, to, we could have potentially avoided during that particular event if we'd had these uh, shift supervisors at that, at that point in time. Um, I did like your graphics. You know, it's just, with the analysis, I looked through it, the analysis, uh, here today or the presentation today helped clarify some of that. You know, the, the head clear for the surge capacity mm -hmm. that, that you get with the increased staffing and then uh, the same applies with your, with the position as a shift supervisors too. Because as I've mentioned before, I've, I've been in, in there before where your supervisors are, are now doing the role, fulfilling the role of an operator. Right. And that ability to see the big picture is just disappears. It's gone because you're not in that position because you're focused on taking those calls and, and dispatching emergency services. So uh, I, I am very much in favor of your, your proposal, as you stated. I will be voting that, uh, that way. Um, again, we cannot afford so to support Metro 911. That's our responsibility. That's our basic responsibility to the public is to make sure that when somebody calls, there's going to be somebody calls 911, somebody's going to be there to answer and they know what they're going to be, what to do and in a, in a timely fashion. So uh, you are, you people are the experts at running a PSAP. We have other jobs. And, and quite frankly, I know what my job is, and, and yeah, I have to, in, in, in my organization, I have to fulfill a lot of roles. But lives aren't necessarily in the balance in, in what I'm doing in, in my normal duties, duties at work. They are in yours. So that I understand, and I do trust you to make those appropriate calls. I do trust that you are going to form those partnerships. I, I, that wasn't even mentioned prior to you coming on as our director. And so here we've had that discussion and I know you've already had discussion with the states and other surrounding PSAPs too. I have no doubt that you're gonna get there. And I, I think with that uh, combining of agencies, it's going to increase services to all and, and it's also gonna bring a reduced cost uh, to all as well. So I'm not sure why I would not trust your judgment on this because you are the experts. Thanks. All right, well, my, my comments are, are as such where, um, you know, I, I'm kind of in the middle on this, to be honest with you. It, it's, a, it's a rich budget, man. Uh, we don't add this many people to departments in the city. Uh, there's a lot of operators. Um, the grant funding's only two years and we'll be sitting here at this dais in two years being like, oh, that funding ran out. Now we gotta come up with the dollars for that. So I love the funding, um, but typically when you get one-time monies, it's, it's more often used for capital, uh, for bricks and mortar than it is for long-term operating because uh, that funds, those funds will dry up. So this, this body needs to know that that's gonna happen, you know, you know after we'll have to figure out how to fund, fund that. Um, what happens if, if this is cut in half? You know, instead of the four, four operators, you go down to, to two. And, and because um, what, what I would have loved to have seen is, hey, here's good, better, best scenario, you know good as we had one, best, you know, as had four, is there better in the middle? What, 
what if this gets gets amended down a little bit in terms of the number of personnel you're looking at here? Sure. So the four operators that we put in for under the grant funding um, in our agency, we feel we still need those four positions to catch us up from some of the previous years where we're still running behind uh, the number of operators that we have deemed that we need to perform the tasks that we perform. Um, where I, I agree with you, Mayor, that when you look at it and you say eight operators over five years, that looks like a large increase in, in staff, and we recognize that. That's why, that's why we said that you know when we get to year 23, we have a new building, we have the county supporting the FF and E for that new building in 23. Maybe that means we don't ask for any extra operators that year, or maybe even in 24, that means we don't ask for any extra operators. And that means that we have to work with what we have, which is what we've always done in public safety in general. Uh, police, fire, sheriff, we, we work with what we have. And, um, and we'll do that. Uh, you know, we, we can't predict their entire future right at the moment because like Councilor Kiley said, we're working on maybe some partnership possibilities and those things could change our, op our operations entirely. And we might be back here saying, okay, now we need to look at this revenue source, but we also have to look at, there's gonna be many more expenses as well. Um, so mm -hmm. those things we'll have to talk through. But I would say our thought is, is with the four positions funded entirely for two years, that will at least keep us at the same status that we're at now. And come 2023, if we are working with the police department to try and do something with those law enforcement boards, to try and uh, maybe do something uh, hybrid, like maybe just during some peak hours of the day, we place an, another operator at those boards on another talk group to try and alleviate some of those push to talks from the other two boards. This gives us the opportunity to do that. Um, the thing is, is in communications, it takes so long to build an employee. Yes, we have a six month training program, but then it's another six or 12 months to become efficient as an operator to really get a good grasp on, on how to perform those duties and, and become comfortable as a independent worker. So we're still trying to catch up from our request in 2020, which was for four operators to be call takers. We haven't got there yet because in 2000, 20, we lost several people from our agency that moved out of state, that uh, went to other positions. So we haven't even been able to put that practice into play yet because we're still trying to train people to get there. So that's why I say, Mayor, that um, could we cut the number from four down to two? Yes. Um, and, and we'll do whatever this board uh, gives us direction to do. Um, we just feel that uh, to pass on the grant funds um, would not be the, the best idea for us, but we can certainly we can certainly do that. We're not obligated to take the funds. Uh, uh, we can we can adjust to whatever the city and county um, feels that they can support in year 24. Um, I do need to give some credit to our entire Metro leadership team because we all sat down and, and when we created this PowerPoint, including the visuals, uh, we tried to look at it from, okay, what type of learner am I? So that we'd try and fit everybody's personality and everybody's way of understanding things. So we, we, we tried from a group effort to make sure we were hitting all the different learning behaviors that are out there. And I also have to thank uh, the, the city finance team. Uh, Tom Huber was here earlier, and uh, as well as the county. You ben are here, Tom. I didn't see you. Ben. Yeah. Ben Kite is here as the uh, the auditor, and uh, it's because of the city finance team and the auditor's office that we put together a five-year plan. I would prefer to talk about a one-year plan because I know for sure what we're doing for the next one year, but sometimes I don't know for sure what's going on in the next five years. But to be uh, uh, as, as uh, projectory as we can with the city and county to try and make sure that we can accommodate these things in the future, we've put together a five-year plan. And, and that's where I say these four positions that we're talking about from 23 to 26, let's, let's take a look at them at that point in time and say yay or nay to adding any positions. But yeah, hopefully that helps. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate, if I may, uh, Rick's passion for Metro. I've been part of the Metro for a lot longer than he has, believe it or not. Um, 
And I do want to make sure that the staff knows that, frankly, we think they've done an awesome job with the responsibilities they've had, especially with flooding, tornadoes, uh, COVID. I mean, we've all been through that, and yep. frankly, we've been hit with my other job significantly with some of those things. But uh, we have to make sure that we have the staff trained correctly, we have the people to do it, and all that kind of stuff. And if I felt at any point that we weren't able to manage and keep the community safe, I would find a different way to come up with a different number. But I can tell you that it's going to be, as I mentioned, tough to sell this. Mm -hmm. um, and having been an EMT a long time ago, I would have rather had people on the ground when I needed to help rather than people directing where I needed to go next. Because I know that the police department, the fire department, and the ambulance services and all those individuals, when they're out in the field, it's a different environment than lots of cases we'd like it to be. So um, that's a priority for me too. But so I'm, that's why I'm having a little difficult we, difficulty with the admin piece um, because if I need help, I want to make sure it's somebody three feet away from me rather than a phone call away. Right. And I, that's just my personal feeling and that's my experience. Um, so it's not that I don't want to do this for mm -hmm. you guys. It's I don't think I have the answers that you uh, are looking for. Okay. What's the highest staffing priorities of those? Because I say this because every every budget cycle, all the city departments, no one ever says we have too many employees. Right. They always say we need more people. We right. need more people, and they come with a laundry list of personnel requests. And I say if you get two people, who are they? If you only could have two new staffers. So you got business support, division supervisors, and the operators. Prioritize those for me. Right. Well, we believe we could do the division supervisors even if we didn't hire anybody else once we're full staffed. Again, we're still trying to get full staff. We have three that are halfway through training. We have three that just came out of training, and we hope to hire our last three in, in June. But if we were full staffed, we know today that we could implement the division supervisors. Um, without the addition of the four or any other subsequent years after that. Um, again, that's why we call it kind of a um, expense neutral thing because we just, we would downsize the number of supervisors and rather than taking nine people off the floor to perform functions, we're gonna have two people off the floor that are very well qualified and trained. So, you know, it's, it's, it's expense neutral. Um, we know that Anna needs assistance in, in her capacity, um, but like I said, maybe, maybe we can think outside the box and come up with some other solutions that we could bring back to you at a later point in time. Uh, communication operators, our main goal with this is we, I do not ever wanna have to come back and ask for a large increase like we've seen in the last two years. So I'm committed to not having to do that again in the future. Um, and I think the only way we can work around not having to do that in the future is to try and and stay pace with where we are today by adding these under this grant opportunity and then after that you know saying hey can can we or can we not do one position this subsequent year so okay. i think uh i think that's the the best answer that i can <coughs> give mayor so the the four operators are critically important um the other things we can we can continue to brainstorm and come up with ideas and present them. Um, first of all, I just want, yes, I am very passionate for this, this. I have a great amount of passion for this agency. And that's not to say that other members of this board are not as passionate as I, or other people in this room are not as passionate as I. But I think what we're, over the years, I've always seen us playing catch up. I've never really seen us at that point where we're fully staffed mm -hmm. and, and we're, not there, we're not there today. And I think your last point is, is a very big point. You know, we, we, if, we, if we don't try to do this incrementally, we're going to see that, that large increase that really was tough to swallow mm -hmm. uh, again and then maybe again. And, and so if we want to avoid that, uh, 
you know, I, I would like to uh, I would like to follow through with this plan and uh, meet that staffing need to get you let's for once and all for all get you to that full uh, staffing point. Uh, our need for staff is not going to go away. I mean, if we don't put them on now, it's 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 not like we're gonna, not going to need them in 2026 or even you know a year from now. And and I I don't think that uh, you know it is yes it is one time dollars but it's one time dollars that we can put to effect immediately mm -hmm. to the benefit of your staff and to the benefit of all citizens as well. And I should mention too on that budget sheet uh, the page that talked about us having six hundred and forty two thousand in cash balance in two thousand twenty six. I just did some quick math and my. Business manager is probably not going to like that I did that, but I did some quick math as far as if we didn't hire the four additional positions in 23, 24, 25, and 26, if we didn't do that, that would essentially double that cash balance um, in year 2026. It would look more like $1.25 million instead of 642000 So that's where I'd like to come back in those following years, the, the 23 through 26 and just address it each year based on what the capabilities of the city and county are and, and maybe the capabilities will be worse than what they are today commissioner I, I don't know maybe they'll be better uh, but it'll give us a chance then to take a look at those four positions but um, certainly appreciate all the appreciate all the years of service that you've uh, provided to Metro Communications uh, Commissioner Benega and and we certainly respect the uh, respect everything that you say as far as uh, it's a tough position. We're all in a tough position. Mm -hmm. Well, you guys are doing a great job. There's they no are. question really about are. that. That's not even in the conversation. Um, it's just the fact that reality sometimes is not exactly what we would yeah. like it to be. You know, again, if we were fully staffed, I, I, could, I could see questioning bringing on additional four staff. But, you know, as you were doing it, I was thinking another analogy is uh, your, your basement is filling up with, with water, and if you want to keep the water out, you need to have four pumps to do it. Is one going to do it? No, it's going to continue to, mm -hmm. it's going to, continue to fill in. It might slow it down, but it's going to continue to fill up. Two the same, three the same. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, again, for the third time, I do support this proposal. And the, just maybe the last thing I would say, Mayor, is... Uh, again with these grant opportunity funded positions we've been approved for four but it doesn't it doesn't have to be mm -hmm. four it's it's you know we'd like four we would not only like four it's not just a want it's a need but um, if you decide that you know it's something different than four we'll just go back to the coordination board and request less funding for operator positions go ahead I, I hate I should have asked this before. Uh, can you tell me what your retentions percentage has been in the last year? That's a good point. Versus, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I'd be happy, well, maybe not happy to discuss that, <laughs> but unfortunately last year we had a tough year just like the entire nation did. Uh, across the board last year, large PSAPs had a 26% turnover. Metro Communications being real close to a large PSAP, we had a 25% turnover last okay. year. Um, and like I say, these positions, we had one that went to be a local fireman. We had one that um, uh, decided to be a stay-at-home mom. Mm -hmm. uh, we had two that moved out of state. Um, you know, just everybody left for a different reason. Nobody left because of anything in particular. But um, we've been on a good path the last seven months now where we haven't lost anybody, and I'm hoping that we stay on that path for a very long time where we don't lose anybody because then we can get to this position where we're full staffed, get a really good feeling for what our operations are at full staff, but until we get there, it's, it's, it's difficult, it, you know, it's trajectory. Yeah. Thanks for uh, clarifying that. Yeah, I think, because I was thinking the same thing that Gerald was, you know, I, I don't know that in two years if we, if based on past history, uh, if, if we didn't have the funding available to support those staff members that we're necessarily going to have to fire people or lay people off because it's going to take care of itself. It will. We'll never, well, I don't want to say never, but it's very hard to be full staffed in a 9-1 center across the nation. 
we're all in the same boat. It's very difficult to stay main, uh, to maintain full staffing levels. The ones that are generally able to that are small centers of 16 employees or less. And I can say that coming from a small agency uh, in Watertown, we, we just rarely mm -hmm. have people leave the agency. Um, Lincoln County is another example. They have 10, 11 staff there. They rarely have turnover. But in larger centers like uh, Rapid City, Pennington County, Metro, um, you know, you just have, the, the more people you have, the more opportunity there is for, for people that uh, might leave for various reasons. Yeah, and that's public safety in general, really. I mean, we had a meeting this morning, our fire were down 24, uh, police uh, were uh, always recruiting, we're always down uh, officers. So it's it's kind of the nature of the business. I don't ever expect you to get to the point and say, hey, we're good, we got everybody, every chair is full, and it's just it's part of the ongoing process. What, what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to propose an amendment to, to, to this. Uh, so do you want to make a motion to approve this as presented, and then I'll introduce an amendment? Sure. Uh, request uh, or make the motion to approve item number six. All right, and I'll second that. And then I'll, I'll, I want to introduce an amendment. And my amendment would be, um, I would like to amend out the, those four additional operators from 23 to 26. And, and the reason being is um, that's a year away yet. So let's, let's revisit that next year. Let's take the, the grant dollars that we have. Let's fund these four operators, which is already on top of the operators we added last year. So I, I think this council's been very, very supportive I with uh, funding of uh, personnel uh, thus far. Uh, it's not saying no, it's just we don't have the crystal ball, let's wait a year. And since those are in the out years anyway, let's do that next year. You'll have a, uh, a different makeup, you know, the, this time next year, this may be like one of his last meetings. And so, um, and Councilor Erickson for that matter, because mm -hmm. they'll both be off this council in a, in a year. Um, but I, I'm hearing what Commissioner Benninga is saying as well, and, um, and it's, it's hard when we're setting budgets for other departments to look at the net change in you know, 21, 22, and proposed in 23. Um, my other city departments watch that, is the county departments watch that, and it's hard sell. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, that feels like a good maybe compromise, if you will, while still giving you the staff support you need right now. Leave in that, that part-time business support position. I, would, I can support that. Um, and as you've kind of laid out, the division supervisor um, reclass is really just kind of internal mm -hmm. chessboard movement. So, uh, so I, that would be the amendment I would make to uh, Councilor Kylie's amendment to approve. I would make an amendment to remove the four communications officers from, tw or uh, operators from 23 to 26. Uh, for sake of discussion, I'll second that. All right. Want to have some discussion on that? I said my piece. You got any comments, mm -hmm. Commissioner? Um, trying to help out a little I bit. I know you're trying to help, and I frankly don't know where it's going to go when we take it with a bigger group and talk about budget, to be honest. Uh, the recommendation that we make today may be hashed through again. Sure. Um, so, but it's an alternative. I wish we were closer to half of what we were looking at for next year for a percentage of growth, but we're mm -hmm. not quite there. I mean, what's the alternative, that you don't accept the grant money? That's the alternative, is uh, we just don't accept it at this time. We, we uh, introduced new projects to try and receive grant funds for. Um, but yeah, we, it, the money certainly don't, doesn't have to be accepted. We just felt it was a, a good use. This is putting you on the, on the spot, any of you, but do you see any pitfalls with the mayor's amendment? I see none, and I'm very appreciative of, of you know, using the grant money to obtain the four positions as well as, uh, um, you know, using Metro funds to support our business manager. I think uh, she puts in a lot of hours and she does uh, um, just a fantastic job is what uh, what she does. So um, but my only comment would be thank you, Mayor. We very much appreciate, uh, appreciate that. 
I mean, I can't really see any downside to the amendment either. I mean, quite frankly, you, you could, we could pass it as is and then make that same amendment next, next year or two when we go through this budget process. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, yeah, the alternative is, is not to accept uh, state grant money, which is right. no expense to any of us at this particular point in time. I don't see the wisdom in doing that. And so. just to keep in mind, uh, the increases don't change as a result of accepting these uh, grant funded positions. It's still, you know, it's 25 and 20, 25 percent increase, 25 percent in increase in 21, 15 and 22, 13 and 23, and then 999 after that. By taking these positions, that uh, that doesn't change that. That was a five year plan that we developed with the financial people and, and um, you know, accepting the grants doesn't, doesn't change that. At right. All, at all. You know, and before we vote on this, it, I mean, it, I, I really wish that our room was full of legislators right now. <laughs> and, and, and so they could see the dilemma that we're in mm -hmm. because the reluctance to adjust the surcharge at the state level is handcuffing us. And that is something that really needs to be pursued. That's got to be on our legislative platform and that we need to gain support of all of our local legislators so that they can gain support from their colleagues across the state too. So uh, that, that's been evident for years now and yet we haven't been able to address that. Yeah. We, we uh, unfortunately, I was not able to attend the meeting, the statewide meeting that talked about uh, the grant funding and how much each agency was getting and so forth, but Deputy Director Chase was, and one of the comments that, uh, that was made was, you know, we can, we can spend money on all kinds of equipment and technology, but it still takes a person behind that equipment and technology to make things operate. And, and they, uh, the board, the, um, I was told by Director, <coughs> Deputy Director Chase that the board said, you know, um, good job Metro on thinking outside the box and, and uh, going after some personnel versus equipment and technology because personnel is, is the biggest need in every piece app across the state. Uh, our phone systems are taken care of by the state. Our radio systems are um, generally can get some grant funds to help with radio systems. But this is the first time ever that I've seen the state or anybody supply um, funding opportunities in the form of a grant for personnel for PSAP. It happens on the fire side and police side, but you, this is the first time I've ever seen it on the PSAP side. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, I don't recall a time when we've come together with this amount of grant grant dollars. So. Well, we've got a, that amendment on the floor. Any other discussion on that? Just to verify, that the 25 percent that you were talking about, are those mostly operators? So the 25 percent increase is in the city and county support, but not our entire budget. The 25% turnover. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, I didn't clarify that. Uh, our deputy director last year um, chose to, to resign, um, but uh, other than that, everybody else I believe was at the operator level, yes. Okay. All right. Well, let's take a, uh, a vote on the amendment to Councilor Kiley's motion. Um, all those in favor of that amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. aye. All right, that'll pass two to one. So we're at the, uh, the main motion as amended. Discussion or amendments on that? All right, hearing no more. We'll vote on the uh, main motion as amended then. Uh, all those in favor of that say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that passes three to zero. Uh, I don't believe we have any uh, exec session needs today, so we'll uh, move on to adjournment. Just need a motion to adjourn us out. Move to adjourn. Second. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thanks for your work today and your presentation, and um, have a good night.